Hello, I'm Anton Korinek. I'm the economics lead of the Center for the Governance of AI, which is organizing this event. And I'm also a Rubenstein Fellow at Brookings and a professor of economics and business administration at the University of Virginia. Welcome to our first seminar of 2022. This event is part of a series put on by the Center for the Governance of AI, dedicated to understanding the long-term risks and opportunities posed by AI. Future seminars in the series will feel, feature Paul Charest on the long-term security implications of AI and Holden Karnofsky on the possibility that we are living in the most important century. It's an honor and a true pleasure to welcome our two distinguished guests for today's event, Sam Altman of OpenAI and Bill Gale of Brookings. Our topic for today is how to ensure shared prosperity in an age of transformative advances in AI. This is a question of very general interest. I personally view it as the most important economic question of our century. But what made us particularly excited to invite Sam for this is a blog post that he published last year entitled Moore's Law for Everything and to which we have also linked from the event page. In his post, Sam describes the economic and social challenges that we will face if advanced AI pushes the price of many kinds of labor towards zero. The goal of today's webinar is to have a conversation between experts on technology and on public policy, represented here by Sam and by Bill, because the two fields are often too far apart, and we believe this is a really important conversation. Sometimes technologists and public policy experts even speak two different languages. For example, we will be talking about AGI in today's webinar, and that has two very different meanings in the two fields. In public policy, specifically in US tax policy, AGI is adjusted gross income and is used to calculate federal income taxes. In technology circles, AGI, of course, means artificial general intelligence. To be honest, I have certain mixed feelings about both forms of AGI. I want to start our event today with Sam to hear about the transformative potential of AI from him. But let me first introduce Sam a little more. Sam is the CEO of OpenAI, which he co-founded in 2015, and which is one of the leading AI companies focused on the development of AGI that benefits all of humanity. Sam was also a former president of Y Combinator. Sam, OpenAI has made its name by defining the cutting edge of large language models. To give our conversation a technical grounding, can you tell us about your vision for how we will get from where we are now to something that people will recognize as more like human level AI or AGI? And are you perhaps willing to speculate on a timeline? First of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I, I am excited to get to talk about the economic and policy implications of all of this. We spend most of our time uh, really thinking hard about technology and the sort of very long-term future. But I think that the, the short and medium term challenges to society are going to be immense. And it's nice to be able to have a forum and smart people to talk about that with. And we're looking for as many good ideas here as, as we can find. Um, I think that there are people who think that if you just continue to scale up large language models, you will get AGI, not, not the tax version. Um, we don't think that uh, is, is the most likely path to get there. Um, but certainly as you create models that can do more, uh, work with different modalities, uh, have more intelligence that they have developed, that they've learned, um, and the ability to operate over long time horizons, um, accomplish complex goals, pick their own data they need to train on, do the things that a human would do, uh, you know, read more books about a specific area of interest, try some experiments, call a smart friend, whatever. Um, I think that that's going to be uh, something closer to some what feels like an AGI. I don't think it will be an all at once moment. Um, I don't think we're gonna have this like, you know, one day of takeoff or one, one week of takeoff, um, but I do expect it to be an accelerating process. And one of the things that we believe at OpenAI about the way to carefully steward AGI into existence is that we need to, the continuous, a continuous deployment and a roughly constant rate of change is better for the world. 
So rather than have people all of a sudden wake up and be like, well, I had no idea this was coming in. Now there's an AGI. We would like it to just feel like this continuous arc where society, institutions, policy, economics, people all have time to adapt. Uh, and, and, and importantly, that we can learn along the way what the problems are, how to align these systems, um, how to, you know, well in advance of having something that would be recognized as an AGI, really have learned how to align these systems. And, you know, I don't think our current techniques are gonna scale without new ideas there either. Um, but I think that's what the path looks like. There'll be a lot of new research. There'll be a lot more scale. Um, there will be a lot of complex systems integration and engineering, and there will be this ongoing feedback loop with society. Um, and the sort of societal inputs, the infrastructure that creates, that trains these models, these models together, all of that will be at some point recognizable as an AGI. Um, in terms of timeline, I don't know. Um, you know, I do think this will be the, the most important century, I'll say that. Thank you, Sam. Now let's turn a little bit more towards the economic implications. What do you view as the implications of technological advances towards AGI for our economy? It's always hard to predict the, the, the details here, um, but at the highest level, I expect as the, the, let's call it the price of intelligence, you know, how much you have to pay to get a task that requires a lot of thinking um, or intellectual labor done, um, that that gates a lot of other things throughout the system. And in fact, there's some levels where just no one, no one person or no group of people that can coordinate well is smart enough to do something. So there's a whole lot of things that don't happen. And as these AI systems get way more advanced, um, I expect the price of cognitive labor to trend way down. Um, and that has a ton of implications that are positive for people. Um, it also has enormous implications on wages for cognitive labor. Mm -hmm. uh, you titled your blog post on this topic, Moore's Law for Everything. Uh, could you perhaps expand a little bit on uh, what does Moore's Law for Everything mean to you? Um, well, I, as you can probably tell from the title, like I think this whole idea that, that you know, the the, the, let's call it the cost of intelligence can fall in half every two years or 18 months, whatever you want, whichever version of Moore's Law you want. I think that's a good thing. Um, I think that, you know, it's like sort of like well known that compound growth is this incredibly powerful force in the universe that uh, almost all of us underestimate, even those of us who think we understand how important it is. Um, that's when the curve goes like this. It's like equally powerful in other cases when the curve goes like this. Uh, and and this idea that we can just like have, you know, twice as much of the things that we value every two years and that there will be uh, not just quantitative jumps, but qualitative ones, things that just weren't possible before. I think that's great. Um, you know, if, if we look at the last several decades in the US, think about what wonderful things have been accomplished by the original Moore's Law. Um, and think how happy we are to have that. I mean, I was just thinking today, like what the, what the pandemic would have been like if we all didn't have like, these massively powerful computers and phones that, um, you know, so much of the world came to really depend on. Uh, and that's just, that's one little example. And then contrast that with industries that have had, uh, let's say the opposite of that, just like runaway cost disease um, and how we feel about those. Uh, so, so I think we like, we can, we must embrace this idea that uh, AI can deliver a technological miracle, a revolution on the order of the biggest technological revolutions we've ever had. And that is how society gets much better. I think the challenges society has faced at this moment feel quite huge. Um, I think people are understandably quite unhappy about a lot of things, um, but I think lack of growth underscores a lot of those. And if we can restore that, um, and I think one of the best ways to restore that is AI cutting the cost of cognitive labor. Um, and we can all just have much more. And, 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 and a great rate of progress. Um, I think a lot of the challenges in the world can get much better. This is really fascinating. So cutting the cost of everything by 50% every two years or doubling the size of the economy every two years, no matter which we put it, uh, is really a radical change from the growth rates that we face today. Now, some yeah, and, and like we're not, you know, society uh, doesn't really do a good job with radical ideas anymore. We don't think yeah. them, we don't think about them. We no longer kind of seem to believe they're very possible, but sometimes technology is just too powerful and 
we get it anyway. Yeah. Now, some people assert that once we have systems that do reach something like the levels of AGI, there will be no jobs left whatsoever because AI systems will be able to do everything better. They will be better academics, better policy experts, even better CEOs. What do you think about this view? Do you think there will be any jobs left and what kinds of jobs would they be? I think there will be new new kinds of jobs. Um, I mean, I think there will be a big class of things where people want the connection, um, the humanity of like another human. Um, and I think that will happen. Um, but I think we're even seeing some of the things that people do when they have, you know, like way more money than they need to spend and and then and they want they still want to buy status. And I sort of believe that the human desire for status is sort of unlimited. And I think NFTs are a fascinating case study and we can see much more of things in that direction. But, you know, it's hard to sit here and predict the jobs on the other side of the revolution. But I think we can say some things about human nature that could help us guess what they might be. Um, it's always been a bad, it's always been sort of like wrong to say that after this new technological revolution, there will be no jobs. Um, the jobs have looked very different on the other side. In this case, I expect the jobs to look the most different of any of the technological revolutions we've seen so far, because this idea of cognitive capabilities is such a big part of what makes us human. It's, it's sort of the most remarkable of all of our capabilities. And if, and if that gets done by technology, then it is different. Um, but, you know, I think we'll find new jobs. They'll feel really important to the people of the future, and they'll seem like quite silly and frivolous to us in some cases. Um, but there's a big universe out there. And we or our descendants are going to hopefully go off and explore that. And there's going to be a lot of new things in that process. That's really interesting. But let me move to the realm of public policy now. Uh, now, one of the fundamental principles of economics is that technology determines how much we can produce, but our institutions determine how it is distributed. You wrote that a stable economic system requires growth and inclusivity. I guess the growth will emerge naturally if your technological predictions materialize. But what policies do you advocate to make the growth inclusive? Make everybody an owner. Um, I think we, I am not a believer in sort of paternalistic institutions deciding what people need. I think it ends up being wasteful and bureaucratic and they're probably mostly wrong about how to allocate it. Um, I'm also not a believer that you can have a long-term successful capitalist society in which most people don't own part of the upside. And so the, now look, I am not an economist, uh, even less of a public policy expert. So I think the part you should take seriously about the Moore's Law essay is the technological predictions. I think those are probably like better than average. And the specific economic and policy predictions are like probably quite bad. Um, I meant it as like a starting point of a conversation um, and sort of like my best guess at predicting where things will go. But, you know, I, I'm well out of my depth uh, and I mostly wanted to contribute on the technological piece and some ideas about where I like where I think the technology can shape that or will shape that the, the policy and economic landscape but but the principle that I, I feel confident about is we need a society where everyone feels like an owner and the forces of technology are naturally going to push against that I think that's already happened I think in the US I don't remember the last number that I heard but it's like something like half of the country uh, owns no equities. And that I think is really bad um, or, or land or whatever. And so a version of the policy that I would like is rather than having increasingly sclerotic institutions that I think have uh, a harder time given the rate of change and complexity in society keeping up, sort of to say, okay, now we're gonna have this new program and now we're gonna have that one, now we're gonna have that one. Um, literally just find a way to say, uh, here's how we're going to redistribute some amount of ownership in, in the things that matter. And so everyone can participate in the updraft in society. That's very thought provoking to redistribute ownership as opposed to just redistributing the output itself. Now, um, before we turn over the discussion to Bill, let me ask you one more question. Uh, 
what do you think about the political feasibility of proposals like redistributing ownership or maybe let me make it more concrete what could we do now to make a solution like what you are describing politically feasible i feel um so deeply out of my depth there that uh i hesitate to even hazard a guess but it, it it seems to me like the overton window is expanding and could expand a lot more uh i think that, that's i think a, are ready for a real change and, and things are not not working that well for a lot of people mm -hmm. i certainly uh, don't remember people being this unhappy in the us in my lifetime but maybe it's I'm just getting old and bitter or something. Uh, that's a very honest thing to say. I'm afraid uh, none of us is a real expert on all these changes because, as you say, they are so radical that they are kind of hard to conceive of and kind of hard to imagine what they will lead to. So thank you for uh, this fascinating uh, initial conversation, Sam. And let me now turn it over to Bill. Bill is the Miller Chair in Federal Economic Policy and a Senior Fellow at Brookings. He's an expert on tax policy and fiscal policy and a co-director of the Tax Policy Center of Brookings and the Urban Institute. Bill has also been my colleague at Brookings for the past half year, and I've had the pleasure to discuss some of these themes with him. Bill, Sam has predicted that Moore's Law will hold for everything if AGI is developed, and just to be clear, I mean artificial general intelligence now. Uh, now, economists have long emphasized that there is this second force that runs counter to Moore's law and that has slowed down overall productivity increases, even though we have had all these fabulous technological advances in so many areas since the onset of the Industrial Revolution. And the second force is Baumol's cost disease. Can you explain? Uh, a little bit more about this second force and what would it take to neutralize it so that Moore's law can truly apply to everything? All right. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and to read the very stimulating proposal that Sam put forward. Uh, I am not an AI expert, uh, uh, but I've read a, I've read a few pieces about it in the last week, and I think there's huge potential for tax uh, issues here. So I'm very excited about being part of this discussion. Uh, let me answer the question in, in three parts. The first part is generally economists think technology is, technological change is a good thing. Uh, it makes labor more productive. Uh, there are adjustment costs. And if, if we did things right, we would compensate people. Uh, we normally don't. But in the long run, uh, you have to believe that technological change has been not just a good, but a fantastic thing. We've had 250 years of technological change. At the same time, the economy has steadily increased. Uh, people have steadily been employed. So then AI comes along. And the question is, what's different about AI relative to other technology? And uh, the answer, I think, is the proposed or expected uh, speed of the adjustment and the scale and the scope. For example, uh, if some technology, driverless cars, took place instantly and all people that were involved lost their jobs, all, all the Uber drivers and Lyft drivers et cetera, lost their job overnight, that would be very dis disruptive in an economic sense. Whereas if that happens gradually over the course of many years, then those people cycle out of those jobs, they look for new jobs, they are, they're employed in new sectors. So the speed uh, with which AI is uh, being discussed or the speed of the effects that AI is, it might have uh, is is actually a concern. It, from a from a societal perspective, uh, I think it's possible that technological change could go too fast. Uh, although generally we want to increase the rate of technological change, we'd be careful what we wish for. Um, Baumol's cost disease applies to things like to just to give an extreme example, uh, the technology of giving a haircut. Uh, probably hasn't changed in the last 300 years. It still takes the same amount of time. It uses the same thing. Uh, it's hard to see the productivity of that doubling uh, every every couple of years, every 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 five years. Uh, of course, that that's a, a silly little example. But industries like healthcare and education, where there's a lot of labor input and a lot of human contact, uh, you might think that that Moore's law wouldn't wouldn't come into effect, uh, you know, as fast as it would in the computer industry, for example. 
Now, I, I, I'm not reading Sam's paper literally uh, that everything is going to productivity of everything is going to double in two years. If productivity of 50 percent of the economy doubled every four years, I think it would claim a victory. That would be a massive, a massive change. So uh, there are these forces pulling back on tech on the speed of technological change. And to me, as an economist, the question is just how different is AI from all these other technological changes we've had in, uh, since the Industrial Revolution. Thank you, Bill. Now, let's turn to the public policy responses. If AGI is developed, so that means if the price of intelligence, as Sam is saying, uh, and that means the price of many, maybe most forms of labor, really converges towards zero, what is our arsenal of policy responses to this type of AGI? And let's look at that perhaps both in the realm of fiscal spending and in the realm of taxation. Great. Uh, let me let me say if labor income goes to zero, I, I don't know. That's just a totally different world and we will need to rethink a lot of stuff. But if if we're simply moving in that direction faster, uh, uh, there's a couple of things to be said on the tax and the spending side. I want to highlight something that Sam wrote about the income tax, which that it, it would be a bad instrument to load up. Uh, in this case. Uh, and uh, the point he's made in, a, in his paper is that that the income tax has been moving more toward labor, uh, away from capital. And on top of that, you've got the payroll tax. So loading up the income tax now basically means more tax on labor. And uh, it's a subtle point. It's not even well understood in the tax world. But I think it's exactly right that the income tax is the wrong instrument to load new revenues on. Uh, at least on the labor portion of 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 the income tax uh, on the spending side there's a variety of things that people suggest uh some to accelerate the change like giving people new education and training uh and some to cushion the change like uh, a universal basic income as sam wrote in his paper i actually am much more sympathetic to ubi than uh most economists are uh and and not as a replacement for existing subsidies, but as a supplement. Uh, and that's even without worrying about uh, the downside of the AI uh, revolution. Uh, the other things you could do, which I, I, I sound good in theory, but are hard to implement, is to have a job guarantee. Uh, where with a job guarantee, the, a federal job guarantee, the whole thing depends on what wage you're going to guarantee people. If you guarantee a job at $7.25 an hour, that's a very, very different proposal than guaranteeing a job at $15 per hour. Uh, and lastly, uh, the classic economic solution to this is wage subsidies. Uh, think of the earned income uh, tax credit and, and scale it up massively. And so that, for example, somebody making $10 an hour would get a supplement from the government that's two times that, right? And that would be a way, it's essentially, it, this is a little loose, but it's essentially a UBI for people that are working. Right. And so our, our welfare system tends to focus on benefits for the working poor and does not provide good benefits for the non-working poor. So some combination of UBI and wage subsidy uh, could cushion a lot of people and give incentives uh, to work a lot. Let me focus a little bit more on the tax side now. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about what the many of tax instruments is that we would be left with if we don't want to load taxes on labor and how they would compare? Yeah, sure. Um, the obvious candidate is the wealth tax. What Sam has proposed is a variant of a wealth tax. Uh, I mean, it, it's literally, that's that's where the money is. Uh, and. Uh, wealth taxes as we talked about a little bit have, sort of have administrability issues and sometimes a good substitute for a wealth tax is a consumption tax uh, and they come in different forms uh, but presumably if people are generating wealth it's because they want to uh, consume the money uh, if they just want to save and create a dynasty a, 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 a consumption tax doesn't get at that uh, but you can design these things especially in combination uh, with a universal basic income uh, that on net hit high house high income households uh, very hard and actually subsidize low income households. Uh, a paper that I wrote a couple of years ago showed that with a, a value added tax and a UBI, uh, you can get results that are more progressive than the than the income tax itself. Hmm. Now let's turn to a few more specific proposals. So, for example, 
Bill Gates has advocated a robot tax. Sam has proposed the American Equity Fund uh, and a substantial land tax in his blog post, Moore's Law for Everything. What is your assessment of these proposals and especially proposals that are like in the realm of capital taxation? And what would you propose if AGI is developed and you are tasked with reforming our tax and spending policies? Yeah, uh, both the Gates proposal and the Altman proposal are motivated by good thoughts. The difference is I think the Gates proposal is a really bad idea. I, I don't understand uh, what a robot is. Uh, if it's any labor saving technology, right, then your washing machine is a robot. Your PC is a robot. Your, your operating system, Microsoft Windows is a robot. Uh, so I don't think we want to tax labor saving technology uh, in particular. Uh, and so I think that it, it not only because definitional reasons, but because we subsidize investment uh, most of our policies go towards subsidized investment. Turning around and then taxing it is kind of counterproductive. It would create complicated incentives. And in so I don't think it's a good idea. I, I love the spirit behind Sam's wealth tax proposal. I love the idea of making everybody an owner. Um, the issue with wealth taxes is the, the ability to administer them. So, for example, if you taxed uh, public corporations and private businesses and land, uh, you'd get people moving their money out into bank accounts and gold and art and yachts and stuff like that. So then this is, this is basically the, the whole wealth tax debate in a nutshell, where people say you should tax all wealth and people say, well, you can't tax all wealth because like, how are you going to come up with the value of, of things that are not exchanged on markets? How are you going to do that every year for every person? So then the answer, the, the somewhat, uh, uh, throw your hands up in the air answer, is, well, we're just not going to tax it. Okay. So that's a wealth tax where you just erode some of the base. Sam is coming out from the other way saying there are certain components of wealth that we can tax. Uh, uh, corporation, you know, uh, market value essentially and land, uh, which are two good targets. Uh, so my, my, my nerdy wonky tax concerns are kind of in the weeds about the administrability of the tax and the amount of avoidance and tax shifting it would cause. But I like very much the general idea of saying, here are these changes. They're going to displace some people. They're going to uh, greatly benefit other people. Let's use, as you said, Anton, the institutions that we have to offset some of that changes and uh, share the wealth, essentially, so that everyone can be better off from AI rather than AI causing the, the immiseration of a substantial share of the population. I see Sam has just raised his hand on that. Yeah, that, that reminded me a point that I cut from the essay that I that I had meant to make a better make more clearly is I, I think a, a wealth tax on people actually would be great, but it's too difficult to administer. And a very nice thing about a wealth tax on companies instead of people is the share price is the share price. Everyone's aligned. Everyone wants to go up. It's easy to take some. Um, and I think that would be like super powerful and great. Um, so a, a yeah, I think it didn't come through, but uh, my hope, with, part of my hope with the proposal is that I think these are the two classes of things that are going to matter more than anything else. Sure, people like can buy yachts and art, but it's not actually clear to me why like stashing away a billion dollars and not spending it matters. Like fine, you just like took that out of the economy and you made everybody else's dollars worth more. And you know, if you wanna buy a boat, like fine, that's not, that, that does not go up in value. That's not compounding, that's not creating this runaway effect. So the goal, really the design goal was administrability and focusing on where the big wealth generation will go in the future, which I think is these two areas and, and trade off the kind of like perfect fairness of taxing art and boats too, given that it would be less important. So it looks like we have alignment on this notion that some sort of wealth taxes are very desirable and that there are difficulties for certain classes of wealth. Now, Bill, would you like to add anything more on this? Uh, no, I'd like, let's have a discussion. I think there are a lot of interesting issues raised, and I'd be happy to respond or uh, clarify anything that I said earlier. Okay, great. So let's continue with the Q&A part then. Please raise your virtual hand and get ready to unmute yourself if you have questions that you would like to pose to Sam or Bill, or feel free to add your question into the regular chat if you prefer that I read it out. 
So I see we have a question from Robert. Uh, hi, thanks. So yeah, my question was um, on the administration side um, as an outsider. So this is for both of you. Um, yeah, in the piece, Sam writes, uh, there would obviously be an incentive for companies to escape the American equity fund tax by offshoring themselves. But a simple test involving a percentage of revenue derived from America could address this concern. And that bit, just as someone who doesn't know about tax stuff, that bit confused me. Uh, it wasn't clear to me like how that would be simple or or how that would work. So I, I was just looking for more detail, I guess, from either of you on how that that could work. So like, for, for example, what percentage of Alphabet's revenue is derived from America? How do you calculate that? Thanks. I think they have to report that. Um, so I think like the, I think these companies like say how much of their revenue is from different geographies. Um, the hope would be that like eventually the whole world realizes this is a good idea and we sort of like agree on a global number and everybody tax at the same rate and there's no reason to move around. But you know that's probably a pipe dream and won't happen. There will be at least one jurisdiction who says come here and no mm -hmm. tax. Um, but I think that the uh, I think that like. Yeah, I think companies companies report. Yeah, I wrote a 280 page book on tax and fiscal policy and presented it to a bunch of tax economists. And every question I got was on the administrability of the estate tax reforms I proposed. So they, they, they drilled down way into the weeds, into the details. And I, I don't really want to do that here. I want to the the big picture here is the important the, the idea is a uh, a tax, uh, the tax is essentially on market value. It could be paid in shares. It could be paid in 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 taxes. Uh, but um, uh, the international aspects of it, uh, I want to emphasize, are solvable in the sense that the U.S. and the current corporate tax, uh, we tax foreign corporations that do business in U.S. on their U.S. Uh, income. So there would be a way uh, to do that. Someone just put in a comment about formulary apportionment which uh which again has the feature uh like this proposal that it doesn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good right and uh, i feel like a lot of times in tax policy people shoot for the perfect policy they never get it and as a result they end up with with not even the, the good policy cool thanks let's thank you Let's continue with uh, Daniel and let's maybe collect several questions. So Daniel, followed by Marcus and Jenny. Terrific. Thank you, Anton. Real pleasure to be with everyone this evening. Spoken uh, a lot so far about the distribution problem, about how to best share out the prosperity uh, created by new technologies. Uh, I'd be really interested in your thoughts on a, a, a different problem, which is uh, what I call the contribution problem. Uh, you know, it seems to me that today social solidarity comes from a feeling that everybody is pulling their economic weight through the work that they do and the taxes that they pay. Uh, and if people aren't in work, there's a sort of expectation that they ought to go out there and actively look for work if they're willing and able to do so. And one of my worries about things like a universal basic income or something like universal basic assets where everybody might have a stake in the sort of productive assets in the economy is that it undermines that sense of social solidarity that it you know it means that some people might not be might not be paying into the collective pot through the work that they do i'm, I'm interested to know your reflections on that contribution problem it seems to me that economists spend a lot of time thinking about distributor justice about what the fair way to share our income in society is but we don't spend enough time thinking about contributive justice about how we provide everyone with an opportunity to contribute in society and to be seen to be contributing uh, and things like universal basic income and universal basic assets yeah those sorts of things don't really engage with the the contribution problem that would be my my challenge but yeah very interested in your thoughts so i strongly agree with the problem framing um and i think that universal basic income is only half the solution and universal basic meaning or fulfillment or whatever you want to call it is is uh, participation equally important um or almost as important at least i i think there are going to be a lot of ways to solve this my hope is that the tools of ai are going to empower people so much uh that people will like there will be incredible new art and immersive experiences and games and sort of useful things that get created for others and people will love that it just might not look like work in the way that we think of it right now. I also think that like to get the AGI we want, um, 
that is going and and how we kind of like make governance decisions about that that is going to be something that we want mass participation in tons of people helping to train the ai um, helping to like think about expressing the values we want the ai to uh to incorporate um so my hope is that this idea um that we are racing towards this thing that is going to and and this this set of decisions um that we have to make in its creation are going to be you know, one of the most exciting projects that humanity ever gets to do and sort of significantly impacts the course of the universe from here. And it is this like, you know, most important century in that sense, that that is the mission for humanity that can unite us, that a lot of people can, that all of us can to some degree participate in, um, and that people really want to figure out how to do. So I am hopeful that that is going to be a kind of grand challenge for humanity and a, and a great uniting force. But I think there will be a lot of more basic things where people just create and make value for their communities. Right. So I, the questions that are raised about the value of work and the, the conditionality of work uh, have long dominated American politics. We have a long history of supporting the working poor uh, as much as other countries helping, helping the non-working poor less. Uh, having said that, there's this great concern that UBIs would basically cause people to drop out and just just relax all day and listen to music. Uh, the studies don't show don't suggest that that would happen. The, the there's a maybe a small reduction in labor supply, uh, but the but not in any sense dominant. And and um, the my interpretation of the studies is that the humane aspects of a UBI, the you know making sure people have enough to eat, making sure they have shelter uh, and so on uh, to totally dominate the what appear to be relatively modest disincentive effects on the labor supply uh, of of the recipients. But if you were really concerned, you could combine a UBI with a job guarantee, right? That 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 actually that's a little or Orwellian because if there's a job requirement, it's not universal. But but you could do a job guarantee, or you can do a wage subsidy which again uh, is like a UBI for the working, for people that, that, that work. I think ultimately, you know, uh, this is not a black white thing. There'd be some balance between those two. I feel like we do a bad job at the very bottom uh, uh, for the disadvantage, extremely disadvantaged. And that's why I favor a UBI, but coupling it with a wage subsidy or something like that, which would help pull people into the labor force uh, is, is, is an option. Thank you, Marcus. Hi, um, uh, yeah, I had a question for, for Sam. Um, <clears throat> you said something that didn't quite fit with what I expected you to believe. So, so the thing you said was something like, uh, even in the world where we, where we have AGI, people will still have jobs. Um, and I'm curious about what you, what you mean there. Do you mean that we'll have jobs in the sense that we'll still have things that we do, uh, even though we won't contribute economic value because there'll be an AI system that could just do whatever the, the human did? Uh, or is it the case that humans will be able to provide things that AI systems can provide, for example, because they're just humans and people want to engage with with human service providers or whatever it might be. Yeah, uh, well, well, I meant more the former. Uh, that was what I sort of meant by I don't think that'd be recognizable as jobs of today and they'd seem frivolous, but I think also many things that we do today wouldn't have seemed like important jobs to people from hundreds of years ago. But I also think there will be still a huge value on human stuff. Like we, why do we prefer handmade stuff that's worse than uh, you know machine-made stuff today? There's like something we like about that. Why do we, why do we like value like a classic car or a piece of art when there could be a perfect replica made it's because it's like real and someone made it so i think there'll be some of that as well um in the very long-term future like when we have you know created self-aware super intelligence that is off exploring the entire universe at some significant fraction the speed of light like i think at that point all bets are off um and it's really hard to make super confident predictions about what jobs look like at that point or about what we broadly construed we do then um, but in worlds of even extremely powerful AI, um, but the world looks somewhat like it looks today, I think we're really going to find a lot of things to do um, that people value, but they won't be sort of like what we would maybe consider economically necessary from our limited vantage point of today. Thank you, Sam. Jenny? Yeah, so I sort of like had a question on the global implications of AGI and like redistribution, because I think like the assumption that you guys are making or like the focus that you guys have is like on the US or like on developed countries. But I was just wondering, like, um, 
if, for example, like the U.S. or like another developed country develops AGI, what would be the economic consequences for other countries that are less technologically capable? And like, um, would, would there be like redistribution from like the U.S., from Western Europe to like Africa, Latin America? And also, like, would it be impossible for them to catch up in that scenario? Because a lot of like the developed developing countries today um, caught up through like cheap labor, but like with the Moore's law for intelligence, it seems that developed countries no longer need that anymore. So yeah, that's kind of like a broad question. Look, I think it has to, this, the eventual solution here has to be global. Um, there's like, you know, full stop, there's no way around that. I think we can maybe prototype things in the US. I also think like, feel a little strange, like saying, here's what all the other countries should do too, uh, but, but yeah, I think we'll I think we'll need a very global solution here. Bill, would you like to add anything on that? Uh, just that uh, in the interim, as we're approaching a global solution, if the U.S. or Europe is ahead of the game, that that that's going to result in resource transfers to the U.S. and Europe, not not away from the advanced countries. And uh, this inter this idea of accelerating uh, technological change. Uh, means that kind of once you get ahead, once you get farther down the curve than everyone else, you're going to continue down that curve at increasingly uh, increasing the gap over time. So uh, Anton's question about 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 that, I think, is particularly relevant in an international context. Thank you, Katya. Thank you, I'm Katya. I run the Ensure Prosperity Initiative at the Partnership on AI. Thank you all to Gabay, especially for hosting this frank and open conversation. My question is kind of building on Jenny's. In, in today's world in which a global solution for redistributing ownership doesn't exist and might not exist for a long while, what can AI companies meaningfully do or should be expected to do to soften uh, the economic pull from AI, the potential one, and tackle the uh, um, the medium term challenge that Sam acknowledged from the very top. This is low confidence, but I, I think my first my first instinct is that countries that have low wages today uh, actually benefit from this the most. Um, that benefit from AI, like the problem. Well, the thing we all like about this vision of AI is that um, things we won't get much cheaper and the things that we don't like, the thing that we don't like about it as much as wages fall. And in, in a, I think AI should be naturally beneficial to the poor parts of the world. Um, but I haven't thought about that in depth and I could be totally wrong. I'm curious what Bill thinks. Bill, you... Nothing. Passing, okay. Uh, we have another question by Phil Trammell. And let me invite anybody else who has questions to raise their hand. I think you're muted. Phil? Sorry. Um, so thanks. All this discussion about um, AI and AGI um, has sort of treated the technology in the abstract as if it's sort of the same wherever it comes from. Um, but you know, looking back, it seems like you know if, if someone besides Marconi had invented the radio a month sooner, nothing would have been different. But like if the Nazis had invented uh, atomic weapons sooner, history would have been very different. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, which which category you think AI falls into, and if it's if it's something more like the atomic bomb category, why is that um, sort of less uh, less featured, at least in economic discussions about the implications of AI? Um, Most of the conversations I have throughout most of the day are about that. I certainly think it matters hugely how it's developed and who develops it first. Um, I would say I think about that like an order of magnitude more than the economic questions. Um, but I think the economic questions are also super important. And given that I believe it's going to be this continuous sort of deployment in the world, uh, I think we also need to figure out the economic and policy issues that we think lead to a good solution. Um, so it's not for lack of a belief in the extreme importance of who develops it and how. That's really like why the AI exists. It's just sort of this conversation is, you know, focused on the economic and policy lens. 
just but like i mean even for the economic implications it seems like it could matter who develops it first but it seems like there's this sort of segmentation where in strategic conversations people care about who develops it first when we're thinking about like implications for the wage distribution it's more uh it's more thought of as an abstract technology but like it might be that if what i would say is yeah i mean what i would say is in the in the short the, the short-term issues it matters less who develops it first and then the long-term issues of like the sort of agi as we all think it might happen then it matters much more so i think it's like a time frame issue is maybe how i would frame it bill nope Yep. Okay. Um, so we have one question that Zoe Creamer put in the chat, and uh, I think this is also mostly directed at Sam. Uh, how does uh, your proposal, Sam, compare and contrast against Landemore or Tank's radical proposal for distributed decision mechanisms? So uh, she writes both ownership reform and real democracy result in some ways in the same thing people who carry the risks of intervention actually have real control over those interventions. Is there a reason to prefer moving the world towards land taxation and distributed ownership over distributed decision-making and citizens controlling the public policies? Oh, I think we need to do both of them. Um, I think that they're both, they're both really important. I think one of the most important questions that will come as we develop advanced AI is how do we get the world's preferences in, uh, you know, like let's say we can solve the technical alignment problem. How do we get, how do we decide whose values to align the AGI to? How do we get the world's preferences encoded in that and taken into account? Um, like, of course, I don't think you should like literally make every decision about how AGI gets used decided by a, in the heat of the moment, passions running hot vote of everybody on earth for each decision. But when it comes to like, let's say framing the constitution of AI um, and distributing wide power within that to people, but maybe sort of saying like, you know, here's the guardrails we're gonna follow. Uh, of course, I think we should have something like that. Phil, any thoughts on this question of how much of the distributional challenge we want to solve through private ownership or public distribution and public decisions? Well, the problem is that uh, the private system won't solve the distribution problem. It, it, it will create uh, surplus, you know, but but uh, it will distribute it according to the market system. And the public system, uh, uh, you know, I think Sam mentioned earlier, and I share this, I'm just incredibly concerned about the ability of the public system uh, and, and the kind of the social values uh, political values underlying the the social the in the underlying population. I'm really concerned about the ability to to do anything uh, that's both substantial and right. Uh, and uh, uh, we need, uh, uh, I think, Sam's piece makes his point right at the beginning. If these are big changes, we need big. We need policy to to go big and to actually get it right. Thank you, Sam and Bill, Ben. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I have a question on uh, the importance of the idea of making people owners as um, a way of redistributing wealth. Um, so I'm curious, uh, I guess for, you know, friendship for both of you, um, what you see is the significant difference between um, a system where uh, wealth or capital is taxed and then redistributed in the form of income, but not um, capital ownership versus a system where um, shares of companies are actually redistributed to, to people in the country, as opposed to just, um, you know, dividends or a portion of the wealth earned by the sell of shares. Um, basically, what's the importance of, of actually distributing ownership versus just merely income and wealth? Uh, I think in the short term, it doesn't matter much. Um, <clears throat> but in, uh, my impression is that people would be more likely to save shares than they would be to save cash. Uh, and so there's a potential over the, a longer term, 10, 20 years, uh, to build assets uh, in in a substantial share of the population. Uh, uh, as Sam mentioned, a very large percentage of the population does not own equity, does not have net worth above zero. So um, proposals like sharing corporate shares or you know, uh, in, in, a, in a social policy context, baby bonds have been talked about. I think those things could have effects over long periods of time. 
uh, as you kind of develop new generations that are get that get used to saving this. But uh, in the short run, uh, I'm not sure to make that much difference. Sam? If I, you know, if we give someone three thousand um, dollars or one share of Amazon, and then Amazon goes up twenty five percent the next year, in in the first case, I think people are like, yeah, fuck Jeff Bezos, why does he need to get richer? Uh, but if they have the share of Amazon, they're like, that's awesome. Like I just benefited from that. And I think that's a significant difference. Uh, and I think most people have not, we have not effectively taught or it's difficult to teach or something, just how powerful compounding, compound growth is. And if, if people can feel that, I think it'll lead to a, a much more future oriented society. And I think that's better. Um, I also believe that, you know, ownership mentality is just really different. And then the success of society is shared, not resented. People really want it. People really work for it to happen. Um, I think like one of the magic things about Silicon Valley was the idea that we compensate people in stock and you get a very different amount of long-term buy-in from the team than you do with high cash salaries. Thank you, Sam. Now in our last minute, oh, I see we have one more question uh, from Andrew Trask. You mentioned the notion that prices fall based on abundance created by the cost of intelligence falling, recommending that we tax corporations. In the extreme case of automation, what is the purpose of the corporation if it is no longer employing meaningful, meaningful numbers of humans for primary survival tasks? That is to say, assuming healthy competitive dynamics, would that corporation be charging for its products at all would they not all become free? I have like a long and complicated answer to this question, but there's no way I can do it in one minute. Um, like, let's say that like uh, people are still willing to pay for status and exclusivity and a, you know, beautifully engineered thing that solves a real problem for them. Um, over and above the cost of, you know, materials, good, like materials and labor into a product today. The corporation can clearly charge for that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That was uh, a great way to squeeze it into one minute. <laughs> so let me thank Sam and Bill for joining us in today's webinar, for sharing uh, your really thought provoking ideas on the question. And let me also thank our audience for joining. And we hope to see you at a future GovAI webinar soon. <laughs>